GBU 43B. Massive Ordnance Air Blast. This is the Moab, although you're probably more familiar with its nickname, Mother of All Bombs. It's a title that's been earned well. With an explosive force equivalent to a block of TNT weighing 11 tons, it is the most powerful conventional bomb ever deployed in combat. It derives its energy from an explosive filler of H6, a compound of RDX, TNT, and powdered aluminum, among other things. When the bomb is ready to detonate, an explosive charge triggers a small explosion. This initial burst of energy breaks the molecular bonds that join atoms together. The breaking of these bonds releases a tremendous amount of energy, enough to break the bonds of other molecules until a rapid and cataclysmic chain reaction occurs. The splitting and reassembling of molecules is how all conventional explosives derive their energy in some form or another. At the end of the day, these are just chemical reactions, following a routine not so far removed from something as mundane as the rusting of iron. However, it's fairly common knowledge that nuclear weapons derive their energy from splitting something a little more finicky. The breaking of the nuclear bonds that hold protons and neutrons together converts small portions of the atom's mass into kinetic and electromagnetic energy, exponentially more than any chemical reaction. For comparison, one of the smallest atomic bombs ever built, the 55-pound Mark 54, in its lowest yield configuration, had the same yield of a modern Moab, which, mind you, weighs over 20,000 pounds. Though almost immediately, it became apparent that the energy produced by fission could be used to ignite an even more volatile nuclear reaction. Fusion. While the fissioning of a single U-235 nucleus may produce 11 times more energy than the fusion of two deuterium nuclei, it is simultaneously 59 times larger than the two of them. Mass-to-mass -mass deuterium fusion will produce over 5 times as much energy as fission. Breakthroughs in the harnessing of fusion would directly lead to the creation of the multi-megaton monsters that would go on to define the modern perspective on nuclear weapons. And although the venerable atomic bomb would play the key role of fission primary, its comparatively inefficient mechanics were completely outclassed by the versatility and potential endless scalability of the hydrogen bomb. The atomic bomb didn't go quietly. Got a doll, baby, I love her so. Nothing else like her anywhere you go. A man, she's anything but calm. Regular pint size, I had a bomb. Had a bomb, baby, had a bomb. I want her in my wigwam. She's just the way I want her to be. A million times hotter than TNT. A nuclear vision in her soul Loves with the electronic control Atom bomb, baby, little atom bomb I want her in my wigwam She's just the way I want her to be A million times harder than TNT If you stare at a large radioactive atom for long enough, chances are it'll eventually decay, usually down through a number of other elements before reaching lead. Of course, there is the off chance that instead of decaying like normal, the nucleus may just kind of explode. This is a spontaneous fission, and the products of it include two halves of the former nucleus careening away at a fraction of the speed of light, as well as a handful of neutrons. On an even more off chance, one of these neutrons may impact the nucleus of a neighboring atom. If it is absorbed by the nucleus, this sudden destabilization will cause another fission, releasing several more neutrons. Now, on its own, this isn't going to cause a chain reaction. These absorptions occur pretty far and few between. That is, until you pile enough radioactive atoms together to the point where the emitted neutrons can't help but smash into another nucleus. 
This specific number of atoms is the key value in which a chain reaction will be able to sustain itself. Since the number of atoms of an object is pretty much just its mass, this is its key mass. Although, you know, the word key just doesn't just doesn't have enough power behind it, you know? There's, there's just gotta be a better word out there to describe. Oh, yeah. That'll do. The simplest and most straightforward way to reach the critical mass of an object is to combine two subcritical masses together. Now, if you're in the bomb building business, it isn't as simple as sticking two Lego bricks together. Nuclear reactions occur incredibly fast, so not only do the pieces have to join quickly, they must be joined with sufficient pressure to allow as many reactions as possible to occur before the energy released blows them apart. So, we need something that can make something else go really fast with a lot of force behind it. The gun-type atomic bomb is pretty much exactly how it sounds. Inside the bomb is a barrel. At one end, a solid cylindrical target, and at the other, a hollow cylindrical bullet. When this assembly is triggered, the bullet is fired down the barrel, where it encases the target, and forms a critical mass. The combined cylinder then undergoes a fission chain reaction long enough to create an immense explosion. The first nuclear weapon ever conceived, the Mark I, later named Little Boy, could erupt in an explosion of about 15 kilotons worth of TNT, which is over 1300 times more powerful than a Moab. For all this energy though, the gun-type bomb is still very limited. For starters, only U-235 is a viable fuel source, as plutonium reactions occur faster than the practical limit the bullet can travel. And even then, only a tiny fraction of U-235 actually fissions before it blows the assembly apart. Considering how difficult, time-consuming, and costly uranium refinement is compared to the production of plutonium, and it's not hard to see why the gun-type bomb is a horribly inefficient and expensive design. These significant drawbacks prompted the development of the second type of atomic physics package. Or worse yet, I've seen this happen, implode. No, I don't want to implode, sir. No, no, no you don't. I'm in it for the long run, you know? Yeah, <laughs> implosions are ugly. While a single critical mass does indeed have enough atoms clumped together to reabsorb emitted neutrons, there is still a significant amount of wiggle room for a number of neutrons to not only move around in, but even escape. Now, there's an easy way to remedy this, and that's just to squeeze the atoms together. Increasing the density of a mass will eliminate this space, and cause the absorption of neutrons that otherwise would have just flown off into the air. In fact, this increase in efficiency means increasing the density of a normally subcritical mass could allow it to sustain a chain reaction, thus less material would be needed overall. This is the methodology behind the implosion bomb. At the heart of an implosion physics package typically sits a hollow sphere of fissionable material, called the pit. Within the sphere is what's called a neutron initiator, the initiator provides an initial burst of neutrons that jumpstarts the chain reaction. Early initiators were typically made of beryllium. Surrounding the sphere is a tamper, a dense casing that will help to hold the sphere together to prolong the reaction as long as possible. The tamper is typically made of heavy metals like lead or tungsten, although alternatively the tamper can also be cast from depleted uranium. U-238 is not a fissionable material like U-235. However, when hit by the incredibly energetic neutrons of an erupting nuclear explosion, U-238 nuclei will split, greatly adding to the overall explosive force. Finally, the entire assembly is surrounded by a number of conventional explosives, shaped charges called explosive lenses. When triggered, the shockwaves of each lens, traveling much faster than a gun-type bullet, and with significantly greater force, compresses the tamper, pit, and crushes the neutron initiator at the core. As a critical mass is achieved, the burst of neutrons triggers the cascading reactions. The imploding shockwave and tamper prevent the now fluid pit from exploding immediately. After fractions of a second though, enough visions have occurred to burst free, and a nuclear explosion ensues. Breakthroughs in implosion engineering led to the creation of the Mark III, or Fat Man atomic bomb. 
and almost immediately, its general superiority over the gun design were evident. Both the test of the Mark III's prototype, gadget, and its full-fledged deployment at Nagasaki yielded TNT equivalents of over 20 kilotons, from substantially smaller pits than the Mark I. Although the gun design would find a small niche with its long and slender shape, as ground-penetrating bunker busters and nuclear artillery shells, the implosion bomb would take the mantle as the general-purpose atomic bomb beginning in the late 40s. From the Mark III spawned successively more advanced designs, on and on to the Mark IV, Mark V, Mark VI, and so on and so forth. With each came advancements in weight, yield variability, and of course power, owing to changes in compressive force and the materials used in the pit. Everything changed, however, when in 1951, a workable design for a hydrogen bomb was finally drawn up. This new weapon promised to be hundreds if not thousands of times more energetic than the lot of atomic bombs in stockpile. The device itself utilized the radiation pressure generated by a Mark V bomb to heat and compress a tank of liquid deuterium, sustaining massive fusion reactions that would in turn compress a cylinder of plutonium at the tank's center into supercriticality. This second generation of bomb was primed to usher in a new era that would eventually render the atomic bomb on its own obsolete, and construction and testing of the device was scheduled for the following year as part of the now infamous Operation Ivy. Redundancy, however, is a concept the military knows all too well, and to place complete trust in a radical new design, one that, mind you, had come from a six-year-long line of failed concepts, well, that just wasn't going to fly. The thermonuclear bomb could work, but it could also just be a glorified vision bomb sitting inside a giant flask. The Atomic Energy Commission and Department of Defense wanted a monster bomb one way or another, even if that meant returning to familiar ground. The decision was made to develop a fission physics package so powerful it could rival even the hydrogen bomb, and was to be tested alongside it during Ivy. This was the birth of a device that I have covered previously, but not at great length. The development of such a powerful atomic bomb would prove to be a difficult task with some fairly straightforward and brute force solutions. The design team for this monster bomb was led by one Dr. Ted Taylor. Taylor is quite the figure in his own right. During his youthful years living in Mexico, he would cobble together various substances and chemicals from local pharmacies to make what any growing boy naturally should. Now this is a bit ironic when you consider he would go on to develop a near chronic fear of nuclear war. After beginning work at Los Alamos in the late 40s, Taylor was pretty damn horrified that the lab was almost 100% dedicated to designing and building nuclear weapons. However, his work at Los Alamos with the very weapons he feared would ultimately shape his approach to them. That being, build them so horrifically massive that nuclear war ceases to be war and ends up just being total annihilation. Basically, fruitless for everyone, no matter who you are. Now, while everyone else was gearing up for the arrival of the H-bomb, Taylor had continued to obsess over the potential of fission. Prior to the 1963 limited nuclear test ban, his career essentially boiled down to refining the implosion design to make it as efficient as possible. This made him pretty much the perfect man for the job. After all, he had been one of the minds behind the previous largest bomb, the 225 kiloton cylinder device. While Cylinder was a near-ground-up experimental prototype, however, Taylor would take a more conventional approach to the new bomb. The Mark 18, as it came to be designated, heralded its design from the Mark 6, which in 1951 was arguably the most advanced standard implosion bomb in service. The Mark 6 utilized the standard 32-point system that the Mark 3 had used meaning 32 explosive lenses were used to compress the assembly. The pit, however, was a composite plutonium-uranium sphere of variable composition and mass, giving the Mark VI numerous potential yields of up to 160 kilotons. There were improvements to be made, however, as after six years of service, the 32-point system was beginning to show its age. A 92-point system had been increasingly incorporated into newer designs, among them the Mark V primary for the TX-16 H-bomb under development. 
In 1951, an attempt to incorporate the 92-point system into the Mark VI physics package resulted in the Mark XIII atomic bomb, although this concept hadn't actually been employed yet. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty obvious. The, the Mark XVIII was going to get the 92-point system. This alone, however, could only at best hope to match the yield of cylinder, so attention turned to modification of the pit and tamper. Although plutonium had been the standard fuel for implosion bombs since Trinity, this was more so due to its accessibility and lower critical mass. At the end of the day, more fission reactions could be achieved in a critical mass of U-235 than in plutonium in the same amount of time, regardless of what bomb design it was in. As a result, the Mark 18 was going to get as pure a lump of U-235 as Los Alamos could get its hands on. And not only that, but Taylor was determined to squeeze as many fissions out of that lump as physically possible. Let me ask you this. What's better than a critical mass of uranium? Well, I mean, more than one, of course. The critical mass of U-235 is roughly equal to about 47 kilograms. The Mark 18 received a pit with a mass of 60. Keep in mind, that's slightly less than the Mark 1, which required an absurd amount of U-235 to even work. On top of this, the tamper was cast from natural uranium instead of DU meaning the percentage of U-235 in the tamper jumped from 0.2% to 1%. This core configuration resulted in a mass of fissionable material roughly four times greater than the standard critical mass of U-235. This absurdly high enriched uranium content would lend its hand in naming the device. In DoD and AEC circles, highly enriched uranium was known by the name Oroloi, an acronym for Oak Ridge Alloy after the primary uranium enrichment site at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The Mark 18 was subsequently christened the SOB, or Super Oroloi Bomb. Now, understandably, having a giant fissionable mass basically teetering on the edge of criticality was uh, worrisome, to say the least. The slightest compression of the pit and tamper could trigger a chain reaction, one that may not release its total energy, but could very likely match Trinity or Nagasaki. To mitigate this, Boron chains were inserted into the core while it wasn't in use. Boron nuclei absorb neutrons, the very reason they are used as control rods in nuclear reactors. The hope was that, in the event of a misfire, the boron would significantly slow down the reaction. This wouldn't prevent an explosion per se, but it would prevent a full-on nuclear explosion. Of course, that is, until the chains were removed. On November 16, 1952, the completed Mark 18 prototype was loaded aboard a Convair B-36. It was flown out to Enui Takatoa in the Pacific, where at 11.30 a.m. it was unleashed on Runa Island. At the instant the bomb's onboard altimeter registered a height of 1,480 feet, the 92 detonators ignited the explosive lenses, sending their blast waves crashing down towards the core. In fractions of a second, roughly seven septillion uranium nuclei split, releasing a quantity of energy that would take the Hoover Dam nearly two months to match. 540 kilotons was the final tally for the test. Ivy King. Taylor had succeeded, effectively doubling the yield of cylinder. A remarkable task for a fission bomb. For practically its entire life, the Mark 18 had lived in the shadow of the hydrogen bomb, and with Ivy King, it was finally given the chance to prove itself. It was given the chance, that is. Oh, believe me, it, it proved itself all right. It proved that it could only muster up a twentieth the yield of the world's first hydrogen bomb. Just two weeks before, the TX-16 had indeed gone off, with a yield of 10.4 thousand kilotons. Wow. 
While the hydrogen bomb continued its development through 1953, production of the Mark 18 began as a supplement before the H-bomb could actually be weaponized. In total, 90 completed SOBs wiggled their way off the assembly line, sitting in stockpile until the mid-50s. In 1954 and 1956, Operations Castle and Red Wing tested a number of deliverable thermonuclear weapons in the megaton range, and officially marked the end for the Mark 18. The pinnacles of the research the Manhattan Project had toiled over during the war were dismantled, their physics packages cannibalized, and their casings converted back to Mark 6s. Despite its unceremonious end, and the success of the hydrogen bomb though, it had indeed cemented itself as the world's most powerful atomic bomb. But its record wasn't going to last. In fact, it wasn't even going to make it out of the decade. After all, not every nation had developed the H-bomb. British nuclear weapons are, we'll call it, interesting. Names like Blue Danube or Short Granite contrast heavily to the numerically followed WB or flat out mark mark designations of American weapons, a trend that by no means only extended to nuclear weapons. The British nuclear program itself was born out of the diminishing world influence the UK held post-World War II, and the need to keep up with the New World superpowers in the United States and Soviet Union. Mistrust from the US had also ceased the sharing of information between the two nations, meaning for all intents and purposes, Britain was going to have to start from scratch, and was always seemingly playing catch-up. By the time the British had finally constructed a working prototype for an atomic bomb, both the Americans and Soviets had prototypes for the H-bomb. Not only this, but the two superpowers had begun talks to completely halt atmospheric nuclear testing, a deadline that the British felt would be in their best interest to abide by. This blunted national prowess and stringent time constraint to develop a bomb that could match the power of its contemporaries would lead to a string of designs that were... questionable, to say the least. Much like with Ivy, the British believed it would be advantageous to develop massive fission weapons to supplement the H-bomb's development. Among these devices was a relatively unique design, given the codename Orange Herald. Orange denoting that it was a piece of British military equipment, and Herald denoting that it was a piece of British military equipment. Like the Mark 18, and practically every other atomic bomb of the late 50s onward, Orange Herald was an implosion-type bomb utilizing a reliable but old 32-point lens system. It wasn't your run-of-the-mill implosion bomb, however, as it did employ a couple of innovative implements. By this point, most British weapon designs had done away with the static beryllium neutron initiators in favor of remote electronic initiators that would fire after implosion began. This allowed for a more uniform burst of neutrons, better timing, and an overall more efficient chain reaction. Most other implosion designs continued to use an internal initiator at the core of the device. Orange Herald, however, experimented with an array of external initiators surrounding the core. This left room at the center of the device for the second key implementation, a revolutionary substance, theorized that if put under immense heat and pressure, could bolster the yield of a traditional atomic bomb. Hydrogen. Specifically, tritium gas, in contrast to the cryogenically cooled liquid and lithium combined solid hydrogen used in other weapons. Regardless, this raises a pretty unavoidable question. If Orange Herald utilizes the fusion of hydrogen to increase its yield, why is it not a hydrogen bomb? The answer lies in the technical differences between an atomic and a hydrogen bomb. 
or more importantly, the distinction between a traditional nuclear and thermonuclear weapon. The goal of a thermonuclear device is to utilize the compressive forces of an atomic explosion, usually the initial burst of x-rays, to trigger reactions in another mass. Since the compression of an atomic bomb is exponentially more than any conventional device, it is able to generate more volatile reactions for longer, allowing the total yield of the secondary mass to greatly surpass the primary. In a hydrogen bomb, this secondary mass undergoes fusion, and these reactions can comprise anywhere from 20 to 90% of the total yield of the device. Even the Orange Herald utilized fusion, where it departs from the hydrogen bomb, is in what that fusion was intended to do. Occupying such a small volume within the core, as well as being a gas, means there was very little fusionable material to begin with, much less than in a staged thermonuclear bomb. Fusion in this case wasn't meant to comprise a chunk of the yield, but rather act as an absurdly powerful source of neutrons. As with fission, fusion reactions release an immense amount of neutrons. When compressed by an atomic explosion, this burst of neutrons fans out, and can be used to impact even more fissionable nuclei. The same reason as to why inside or surrounding H-bomb secondaries there are often massive uranium and plutonium tampers. The fissioning of these tampers often have greater yields than the fission primary, except in this case it's the pit itself that's subjected to this wave of neutrons. This concept is collectively known as fusion boosting, and Orange Herald was one such early design of a boosted atomic bomb. It wasn't, however, the first. That was developed by the United States in 1951, tested during shot item of Operation Greenhouse, and given the exceptionally creative name, Booster. The first actual instance of boosting, however, came one shot prior, during Greenhouse George and the test of the... Well, that clears that up. Side note, figured I'd say this now. The head of the design team for Orange Herald at Aldermasted, basically the British equivalent of Los Alamos, was a Dr. Brian... Taylor. No relation. Much like with other British bombs, Orange Herald's pit was cast from enriched uranium. This was done less for yield boosting and more just out of necessity. U-235 was expensive to enrich, yes, but the UK's plutonium production was basically a trickle. There just wasn't enough of it. This meant a large fission core was now even larger, and would be difficult to fit the entire warhead into a bomb casing or onboard a missile. Two versions of Orange Herald were then drawn up, a small variant with smaller explosive lenses, and a large variant that was unchanged. Since the smaller variant would lose a significant amount of compressive force, it was compensated for by increasing the mass of the uranium pit. Remember that a critical mass of U-235 is 47 kilograms, and the Mark 18 had a pit of 60, that, when combined with its tamper, was an assembly that required extreme caution. It wouldn't have been wise to increase the mass far beyond that, either from a safety or economical standpoint. So the engineer settled on a modestly larger... I said questionable, and I meant it. 125 kilograms was over a year's worth of British U-235. The weapons engineers were naturally aware of the danger such a large core posed, and thus Orange Herald was held to some fairly high safety standards. Two failsafes were developed. The first was somewhat similar to the change of the Mark 18. Within the core was room for dozens of steel bearings that would blunt the compression of the sphere and slow the neutrons. These could be removed via a plug at the base of the physics package prior to arming. The second failsafe was a little less crude. At all times, a constant stream of neutrons would be fed to the core. The theory was that in the event of unwanted implosion, these neutrons would jumpstart fission prematurely. These early reactions would then destroy the pit before a nuclear explosion could occur. It was dubious, but Aldermaston was confident, and that was enough for Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. Orange Harold was approved for the British thermonuclear test series, Operation Grapple, and a prototype of the small variant was shipped out to Malden Island in the Pacific.
7,900 feet above the water on May 31, 1957, Orange Herald unleashed a 720 kiloton yield, a 24% increase in yield over the Mark 18, despite being less efficient overall. The actual effectiveness of the tritium as a booster was called into question, with various estimates claiming how much it contributed to increasing the yield. This didn't stop the British, however, from claiming it had successfully tested a hydrogen bomb, especially after Grapple 1, the preceding test. Grapple 1 attempted to test a staged hydrogen bomb prior to the large atomic test of Grapple 2. Unlike Ivy Mike, however, Grapple 1 was a resounding failure, as was Grapple 3, an attempt to rectify the problems of 1. It wasn't until the 1990s that the sham was finally uncovered. Probably because later in 1957, the British did test a successful H-bomb, so no one really cared to investigate. Aldermaston, however, did know about the questionable effectiveness of the tritium in what must have been a fair embarrassment, as the tritium produced for Orange Herald while contributing little to its yield did contribute to the fire at the Windscale Nuclear Station, the worst nuclear disaster in the UK's history. Following Grapple and the reopening of British-American nuclear cooperation, Orange Herald's design was modified for use in the Yellow Sun bomb, alongside the Red Snow thermonuclear warhead. This new design, designated Green Grass, removed the tritium booster, replaced in the core by a bluestone modulated neutron initiator. With a yield estimated between 400 and 500 kilotons, it is likely the second most powerful pure fission bomb ever built, behind only the Mark 18. Regardless of how much boosting actually contributed to its yield, however, fusion boosting, by nature, was designed to outpace the lowly pure fission bomb. So by the time Orange Herald was finally dropped in 1957, the Mark 18 had lost its crown as the most powerful atomic bomb. Though, it wasn't to Orange Herald. Potentially. About three years prior to Grapple II, the United States had successfully tested a device with a pretty interesting design. One that may or may not hold the title as the world's most powerful atomic bomb ever built. And it all revolves around the wild ride that was Operation Castle. One part, 1954. The bomb was 1,000 times the energy of the bomb that stands in Hiroshima, exceeding the power of that bomb, advancing as if it the greatest high explosive giant of World War II. Commander Shields is out in the experience fallout situation at Bikini, and Frank Mota Atoll downwind from ground zero. Tangible, immediate benefits due from Castle are the TX-17, the TX-21, and the TX-15, a small, relatively low-yield weapon of 8,000 pounds. Castle is typically only remembered for the Big Four. Bravo, Yankee, Romeo, and Union and their respective devices. The TX-21, TX-17, and TX-24 were at the forefront of H-bomb design in 1954, employing solid deuterium designs, being aircraft deliverable, as well as being some of the most powerful nuclear devices ever detonated. In a vacuum then, it seems odd that among this multi-megaton series of hydrogen bombs was another large fission bomb scheduled for testing. Ivy had pretty soundly proven that the atom bomb could not compete with the H-bomb yield to yield. So what gives? What gives is that the TX-15, as it was designated, was radically different from any bomb that had come before, more complex than either Cylinder or Orange Herald, and Los Alamos was confident that it would produce favorable results. So get this. When the explosive lenses of the TX-15 detonate, they compress a plutonium core. The immediate burst of radiation is then funneled down the interior of the device where it ignites more reactions in another mass, greatly increasing the yield. That's right, TX-15 was thermonuclear.
Yes, I lied to you, and I'm not sorry about it. The vocabulary surrounding nuclear weapons is a bit more nuanced than just atomic equals nuclear and hydrogen equals thermonuclear. The overarching term of nuclear weapon can be subdivided into generations based on great leaps in design. First generation weapons, relatively speaking, are quite basic. Single stage gun type and implosion fission bombs born out of the Manhattan Project and refined in later years. Third generation weapons and beyond include exotic designs like shaped nuclear charges and cold fusion weapons that don't require fission compression. In between is the second generation, the advent of thermonuclear weapon design. On one side are single stage bombs like Booster and Orange Herald that use fusion to increase fission output. On the other are multi-stage bombs with secondaries meant to comprise a substantial portion of the yield. Included in this category is the classic hydrogen bomb, but it's not an exclusive club. Essentially all hydrogen bombs are staged, but not all that are staged are hydrogen bombs. Kind of. Sort of. Oh boy. Okay, so the long road to developing the hydrogen bomb saw many different concepts for how to get an atomic bomb to jumpstart fusion reactions, running from the classical super to the modern Teller Ulam. Along the way was a concept known as the alarm clock, not to be confused with the TX-14 alarm clock, which was a staged hydrogen bomb tested during Castle Union. The alarm clock concept did employ a fusion stage, per se, it's just that it's... It's just that it was its own sphere, or several spheres layered between the tamper and the pit within an atomic bomb. The US never actually tested the design, as staging made the concept obsolete fairly quickly. However, the alarm clock was semi-independently developed by Andrei Sakharov in the Soviet Union, although the Soviets did get a little help from data Klaus Fuchs passed on to them. This device was named Sloika, which is a Russian layered pastry thing, and after Ivy Mike in 1952, the Soviets pursued the idea fairly aggressively, as well as a 500 kiloton pure fission backup. Where have I... Oh, never mind. In 1953, the Sloika prototype RDS-6S was fired during the Joe 4 nuclear test, churning out a 400 kiloton yield and negating the need for the RDS-7. The British also eventually designed their own layer cake bomb leading up to Grapple, although this was never tested. They dubbed this single-stage thermonuclear approach the Type A hydrogen bomb. Today they are more often called interim weapons. The entire thing is fairly controversial, and there is quite a bit of debate as to whether or not these designs should even be considered H-bombs. More often than not, this is political in nature, as claiming these designs are not H-bombs means the Soviets didn't successfully test one until two years later. Regardless, however, the goal of the layer cake bomb was to ignite substantial fusion reactions in the hope it would comprise a bulk of the yield. This makes Sloika, not so much from a technical standpoint, but rather from a functional one, more in line with a classic H-bomb than a boosted weapon, even if the single-stage design was an inefficient approach. TX-15, however, was undoubtedly a two-stage bomb, although it too traces its roots to the development of the hydrogen bomb. Or rather, the modern hydrogen bomb traces its roots to the TX-15. In 1951, when Stan Ulam drew up his plans for the first stage thermonuclear bomb design, it wasn't for the hydrogen bomb. The design's secondary was basically a massive fissionable tamper, an atomic bomb triggering another atomic bomb. Now, eventually this was adapted by him and Edward Teller to include a secondary of deuterium rather than uranium, which led to the development of the TX-16 and eventually Ivy Mike. The AEC and DOD, however, still saw potential in the design. The compressive forces required for ignition of a fission secondary were significantly lax compared to a fusion secondary, giving the design an overall low risk of failure. And given that fission had been worked with for over a decade, this ultimately made it far more predictable. A fission secondary was also significantly less complex, making it smaller and lighter than a hydrogen bomb. Given that the goal of Operation Castle was to develop and test lighter aircraft deliverable megaton weapons, and it's not hard to see why the TX-15 was so appealing. In 1954, a working prototype of the device was finally assembled, given the codename Zombie. The bomb utilized the same Cobra primary as Castle Bravo's TX-21, which would be used to compress the fission secondary and its U-235 tamper. The test of Zombie was originally planned to be the fifth of seven castle shots, but after some... Uh, 
unexpected results with Castle Bravo, the test schedule was completely reorganized. After several months of waiting, on May 13th, silently floating in the dark, on a barge in the Ivy Mike Crater, everything came together. At 20 a.m., Castle Nectar erupted on Anuidak Atoll, becoming the final test shot of Castle. The final yield total was set at 1.69 megatons, making Nectar the only test of Castle with a correctly predicted yield, a fair testament to the soundness of the design. Although 1.5 megatons is small, even when compared to the smallest of the Big Four, it is still outrageously powerful for a fission bomb well over twice as powerful as Orange Herald, and three times as powerful as the Mark 18. TX-15 unquestionably became the most powerful atomic bomb ever tested. Right? Well, maybe not. See, if TX-15 had been built from Ulam's original design, it would be. It wasn't, however because around 20% of its yield came from fusion reactions. Los Alamos engineers had made one critical pivot away from the Ulam concept, the introduction of deuterium into the TX-15 secondary. Now, just because a bomb utilizes fusion doesn't mean it's an H-bomb. That's been made clear. Fusion boosting and hydrogen staging employ very distinct uses of their fusion reactions. So whether or not the 15 is an H-bomb depends on what those reactions were for. And your guess is as good as mine. Technical working documents on an American thermonuclear bomb aren't exactly the most readily available thing, especially for one as pivotal as the TX-15, leaving the exact mechanics of the 15 secondary to speculation. It may have just been a boosted weapon, it may have been a hybrid teller Ulam layer cake like RDS-37, which had a suspiciously similar yield, or it may have been something completely different. Nothing is for certain. What is for certain, however, is that TX-15 was, at the very least, not a classical hydrogen bomb like its counterparts in Castle, and had performed admirably when tested. Castle Nectar's success pretty much sealed the TX-15's fate. In 1955, it went into service with the Air Force under the formal designation Mark 15. Along its production life, Los Alamos made some tweaks to the design here and there, you know, to improve efficiency. The Mark 15 Mod 2, for example, which became the first American airdrop thermonuclear bomb during Operation Red Wing, had a slight yield increase over the Mod 1 of about... double. In total, 1,200 of all Mark 15 variants were produced prior to 1957. In 1965, the Mark 15 was finally replaced by its successor, the Mark 39, which ironically began its development as just another Mark 15 modification. Its compact design and small size would give nuclear engineers needed insight into producing the size of thermonuclear weapons, and from that insight would spawn a lineage of designs ranging from tactical bombs and bunker busters some still in service today. Whether or not the Mark 15 holds the title of most powerful atomic bomb is... dubious. However, it is clear that the bomb had a profound impact on the history of nuclear weapons, and ultimately served a solid career itself. Far more than can be said for either the Mark 18 or Orange Herald. I mean, that is until a Mark 15 plummeted 7,000 feet from a crippled B-47 over Georgia. Oh, bro! Well, uh, you can't win them all. But hey, at least Castle Nectar became the most infamous explosion in internet history. Say, what's that button do? I'll show you. What the fuck? <laughs>